minutes before lunch, we're now going to listen to John Little. Thank you. Wow, hold on. I, I mean, I don't mean to be funny. You got some whoops. Yeah, well, that's that's that's. You've that's, got you've bought. Who have you paid? Who have you brought? That must be a lot. Yeah. Really? That was and a lot of beer last night. That guys, was a lot. Of, you've been on the beer hunt. And the only other thing I was going <laughs> to say is, like, John and I had had this conversation about it's live, John. We've got live stream, the swearing, the ranting. Mike Edwards, you've just blown that out. Freed me up, Mike. So it's freed you, you up. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy your talk. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. And um, I guess the first thing, before I uh, forget, the first thing to I'd like to say is what an amazing organization, amazing Julia, amazing Beth Chateau to put this on. You know, honestly. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, definitely amazing. And. Um, the other thing is, I feel like I've been done already, don't you? Because I'm, I'm normally brought on as the novelty act at the end of things, where I talk about bugs and waste and rubble and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, yeah, I'm the novelty act. I am no longer the novelty act, which is fantastic. When you get you know, heroes of mine like Fergus and, and, and Dan Pearson and all that, you know, when it's utmost in all those people's minds, that's, a, that's, a, that's an incredible change. And, uh, uh, and we should be celebrating it for sure. So, what am I going to talk about? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, I've been in, uh, sort of mildly fascinated by industrial areas, and, and the south of Essex, where I come from, has is, is got a nice selection of industrial areas. Um, and landfill sites, another wonderful thing we have. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it feels to me like this whole thing about rewilding the mind, it's, We've got, to, we've got to focus on complexity. It's complexity of landscape that delivers biodiversity. Um, uh, we, we, and if we can rewild the minds of landscape architects and architects, and more importantly, planners, and the whole bloody policy and planning system that just negates all this complexity, then we will actually make a difference, I think. But before all that, I always put this slide in, I always put this slide in uh, at the end because it's about maintenance and I think, oh, I'll put it in the end. Then I always have to rush it. And, and I thought when I was uh, sitting down there last night, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to move this to the front because maintenance is utterly crucial to everything. And maintenance is, and, and it's a terrible word, I know, um, but gardeners, 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 gardeners. That's, and if you look at the, the, uh, the, the image on the right, I love this image on the right. So, so in other words, you, you can't, they've, de they've designed this spade so you can fit, fit three idiots for the stainless steel, <laughs> for the stainless steel, uh, uh, st you know, that, that photo that funders want, that's the classic funders photo. So this tree gets put in, these three guys stand there, uh, they get the photo, everyone goes away, the tree dies, no one looks after it, total waste of time, and scheme after scheme after scheme, don't you think, all the money goes into the infrastructure, None of the money goes into caring and looking after it afterwards. It's obscene. So, so we had this when we were looking after. We looked after a social housing estate in, in Hackney in East London for, uh, well, nearly 20 years, 18 years. And we could get money. We were a deprived area, supposedly. So we could always get money, always get money to build shit. Never can we get money to look after it afterwards. It's utterly, you know, and if we can, like, that's a, that's a mindset change that we've got to shift. We used to cheat the system in the end. We used to get the 10 grand for the, for the I don't know, pergolas and the raised beds, and then we didn't, uh, then we didn't build the pergola, and we'd, we'd get a local gardener to work in that space with that money. And the money you spend, and I'm going to be talking about infrastructure after this, don't get me wrong, but the money you spend on people and gardeners, on people just caring for a place, that money is way the way the best value you're ever going to get from your money. But it's not sexy. You can't put a stainless steel spade in front of it, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't fit with the funding schemes. And it's such a shame. Anyway, so I'm glad I got that in early, because obviously I'm always uh, looking at it afterwards. So I won't go on about this, because you know all this stuff. 
Uh, and we are supposed to be an, uh, a nation of animal lovers, aren't we? Uh, we like a lot of pets. Um, but what we don't seem to like is uh, biodiversity. Uh, and you can see, I mean, this is just, don't you think this is just appalling? We're, we're a nation of gardeners, we're a nation of animal lovers, we've got all that going on. What has happened? It's, it's just well, awful. So, uh, these two books, one of these has been mentioned already. Amazing book. So if you're interested in, in, in this, this blew me away, and it, it, it just synced into everything we were thinking for all these years, is that essentially this country wasn't a closed canopy woodland place. It was a chaotic, smashed to pieces, trampled, chewed. It was that level of chaos is what it was. And all our wildlife has evolved with that. Our wildlife has evolved with that constantly changing, uh, chaotic landscape. It really has. And if we can, and, and, and so on the bigger scale, you know, that's what we should have. And, and obviously, it was all talked about yesterday, and the rewilding, the big rewilding projects, utterly crucial. Without those, we are just pissing around on the small scale, to be fair. No matter what we do, we are. So we want that, and we want bison, and we want beavers, we want all that stuff. But... What I'm going to try and talk about today is the bits of the landscape that we can't put bisons in. You know, the bits of the landscape that are close to houses, that are uh, around our housing estates, that are around our schools, around our universities. Who's looked at a uni Who's looked at... Have a look at this one, right? I mean, you know, I, the, the, someone, someone put a slide up of a, of a plastic box hedge, I think. I think it was Dave Gorson, was it? Um, there's plastic box hedges out there. And, and I, you know, I'm not picking on this, but... but Unbelievably, our highest sort of, uh, you know, the best quality learning places have the worst quality landscape. This the, out here should be a laboratory for students, shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? It shouldn't be an amenity space. <laughs> anyway, so this now uh, this was I was looking for a fly tipping picture. I had a fly tipping picture on my previous talks, but wasn't the best fly tipping picture. Um, so I looked at my local community forum. <laughs> And as you can imagine, up popped thousands of fly tipping pictures. So I had a massive, I had a lovely choice of looking through. So this is what it's all about, if you ask me. So we're trying, we're trying desperately to find a fly tip that we're allowed to leave alone and survey, to get an entomologist, to get an ecologist, to look at this and see what happens to this right, over time. That, I can virtually guarantee you, will be way more biodiverse than the bit of countryside that's next to it. It will, because, look at it, it's, it's the most complex piece of landscape you've ever seen, isn't it? It's got different pieces of material, it's got niches, it's got south side, north side, damp places, dry places, litter. It's got all those things that actually add to the biodiversity. Now, I know we don't want to do that, but we want to learn from that and think, how can we create that complexity in our landscapes? Some of the fly tipping, though, is not as good. <laughs> so I'm trying to think what habitat would ever, where there's any niche in this thing, but uh, maybe there's not. There's not. Not as good. So I guess once you take away all the, the big herbivores and the glamorous animals like beavers and stuff that obviously nap and a lot of the rewilding is doing, once you, well, if you can't use those, what are we going to do? You know, what are we going to do? So we, you know, if we want to, you know, a bison would would, would trample and, and turn up areas and knock things around. Well, we've got a mini digger that could do that probably. The bison gets seeds attached to it. Uh, well, Benny, the guy I work with, Benny's leg just as good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, there you go. Benny's in the whole picture. <laughs> Here you go. See, I mean, we can do everything these things can do, right, can't we? You know what I mean? It's a bit more of a pain, because if you've got an animal doing it, it's a lot easier. But we can do all this stuff. So that's why, and that's why I think, and I, I, I've got a slide coming up about Fergus's place, but just to mention it now, I think that's what's amazing about Dixter and why, it's become, why the biodiversity survey was so incredible and why he's got so much biodiversity. It's not just the plant, because Fergus delivers pollen and nectar, doesn't he, full on, all year, amazing. I mean, if you were an insect, you would fly to Dixter, wouldn't you? It's like a, it's like a massive kind of, uh, 
uh, a pallet. But what Fergus has got in Dixter is old buildings, compost heaps, gardeners, bits of old hedgerow, uh, just dry stone walls, all that structural complexity. And that, I think, is what's made the biodiversity so good. There you go. See, so this is my, this is my, my brother who's a very reluctant gardener. You can probably see it on his face. I've worked with him for many years. We look, this, is, um, this is Clapton Park Estate on the left that we looked after. Um, and mowers, yeah, we can do the same, can't we? And there's a whole thing with, with um, no mow May, great. But we also should have a scalp September. So we can, we can set our mowers uh, lower in September and we can scalp the ground, we can uh, bring up some bare ground and we can improve the biodiversity by doing that. We need this mixture, scalped, long, short, complexity, and so on, and so on. You know what I mean? I mean, these, these are things that... Uh, so this is me on the left. Well, it's not me, but it's me trying to kill the tree. Anyone try to kill a tree? Ooh, that's... <laughs> it's... it's Believe me, it is really difficult. So this is, I, I've, I've chainsawed and ring barked three times on this wild pear tree, still alive. Because, I don't understand why it's still alive, but that tree is way more valuable to me dead. I've got plenty of live trees around that tree. Way more valuable to have that than that being alive. And that, that's, that's another thing that we're going to talk about later. So yeah, here's me trying to become a little bit of a woodpecker. Uh, yes, and ponds and beavers. So, oh, there we go. So, uh, again, this whole thing, these areas, you know, and, uh, around the edge of the ponds, trampling, that disturbance is wicked for biodiversity. Salisbury Plain. What's Salisbury Plain? One of the best, most amazing nature reserves in the country, right? And why is it so good? Because tanks drive across it. Because they create that mixture of habitats, don't they? You know, so this is, and it's a freeing thing. Once you, once you realize this stuff, you think, yeah, I can do what I like. You know, I don't have to follow any rules. I can just disturb what I like. I can move what I like. I can do what I like. It's, it's, it's a very freeing thing. Uh, we do still have the fox left. I, I, my, my daughter was insistent I got a Marty Bouche reference in somewhere on this talk. Um, <laughs> so the fox is left, obviously. We've got rid of all the other animals. I mean, the fox is left because he's adapted to us, and he doesn't mind a bit of rubbish, does he? The fox loves a bit of brush. And what the fox has done on the left-hand picture is to dig out. We put sand out for solitary bees, mounds of solitary bees. And, we, and I was, because I'm a bit of a gardener, you know, I, I put the sand out and I raked it into a lovely dome. You know what I mean? And I was eyeing it in, getting it symmetrical, making it look cool. Obviously, the fox is smart as they are. Once the bees were in it, he's going to dig it out and get the bees and get the food. But when he did that, he created a vertical face in my lovely dome Way more bees nested in that vertical face than they did on the dome. So it's that wonderful disturbance, that wonderful uh, complexity that these things are going to change. So this is a brownfield site. And is Chris, Chris, is Chris Gibson here? Yay. So this is a brownfield site near me called Canvey Wick. Um, and uh, lots of amazing facts about this. One is it was just, it's just been abandoned since the 1970s. Third most recorded species of vertebrates on a single site in the UK. More biodiversity per square foot than any other site in the UK. Chris Gibson. So, uh, isn't that amazing, right? This is, this is comparing it to ancient woodland, ancient, all those kind of places you think, oh, the biodiversity, it's all here, right? It's not. It's in a place in Essex that's an abandoned site. That is where all the... Now, you know, you, but the, the, and the, the, the wonderful thing about this is that we can't, so Abernethy Forest and Dungeness, more species, we can't create those, can we, instantly? We can't create them over 50 years, those places, right? But we can recreate a brownfield site, can't we, quickly? That's the optimistic thing. All that wildlife has come in in 50 years. That's really amazing, isn't it? If we could, and so why aren't we saying, look how amazing Brownfield is, why don't we design that back into our landscapes? What is it about Brownfield that makes it so good? You know? Now, again, I've, all this stuff has been taken away from me because everyone's talking about this stuff, but here's my entomologist, <laughs> James, the most amazing, amazing guy, spends oh, two or three hours there in the fennel, sucking the, sucking the insects off the flowers. Incredible guy, right? And you, you, you absolutely need this guy. And as Fergus was saying, 
we've been banging on about this stuff for years, bluffing mainly. So I've been saying, yeah, this is definitely good for biodiversity. This must be good for biodiversity. Not really sure. As soon as James comes along, all those things kind of click in place. You realise what is good, what is bad. And more importantly, what he told us when he surveyed our place, what we didn't have. So what group of uh, invertebrates we didn't have and what habitat they, they like. Then we did that habitat. You know, so that's the joy of the, If you garden for invertebrates, concentrate on invertebrates, you get all the other stuff for free. So we want to design new brownfield. We want to take the principles of brownfield and design it in. This is two years after we sowed this area. There's no topsoil in this. This is all construction waste and sands, all direct sown. So I haven't got the expertise on plants. I know a few wild plants. I was a kid. I loved wild plants. I couldn't do your planting plan. Um, there's loads of people here, amazing experts that can do that. I want to talk about all the other things, the, the structure, the soils, and the topography. Because they get missed, don't you think, in new landscapes? You know what I mean? It's flattish, and it's topsoilish, and that's pretty much most landscapes. And if you do that, you're going to get a very similar mix of biodiversity, I would say. So this is where I uh, live, where I'm lucky enough to live, in, near Basildon in Essex. And um, this is where we trial all this stuff. So, um, we get lots of uh, different materials from all over the place and we trial it to see how good it's for invertebrates, how it works for plants. It's just a, a wonderful space and we're very lucky. And what this does, this, this kind of variety of materials and topography, uh, it gives you more edges, doesn't it? It gives you more edges. And what James, the entomologist, told us, it's that edge landscape that is the, the most exciting from a biodiversity point of view. So the more variety of materials and, and topography you get, the more variety and vegetation, you're going to get more edge. Edge is good. I mean, this thing, I mean, shopping trolleys in ponds, it is the classic kind of, you know, you could get 100 volunteers to come out and help you pull a, pull a shopping trolley out of the pond. And it, there's something about it that really freaks us out, and that, you know, that whole idea of someone, anyway, the whole idea of someone being even bothered to push a shopping trolley that far and put it in a pond, it's quite amazing. But... What is that doing, of course? It's trapping material, it's creating shelter, it's creating nesting space. I mean, you know, we, we, we sink ships, don't we? Where's all the wildlife in the, in, the, in the ocean? It's around the ship, right? A man-made thing. So we don't have to have a shopping trolley, we could have a stainless steel sculpture there. We could have something, we could create that complexity. And there was a survey done by a student a couple of years ago that looked at biodiversity in riverbanks, and she found out that there was more biodiversity in the litter than there was in the rest of the riverbank. Now, that's because we've, we've removed our, our natural sort of, our natural structure, haven't we? We've tied it up. Litter has now become our, our new complexity. Oh, sorry. So, I was thinking, well, you know, this is a good idea. We need to chuck all this stuff around. You know, fly tipping's good. It's all great. Um, but how am I going to actually fit that into a landscape? How are we going to make that acceptable and palatable? Uh, and so now I'm mildly obsessed about gabions. Well, very obsessed about gabions, actually, because they, uh, we've used it, we use them such a lot because they give you that, that, that uh, I like to call it like a, yeah, a unit of habitat. So you can specify these things in projects. They give you all the all amazing different structural things. For instance, on this one, uh, we're, we've, put, we've embedded uh, bumblebee nesting, small mammal nesting, um, and that's all within the, within the rubble. And the rubble, the gabion stone, is crushed toilets and sinks and, and uh, bricks and rubble. It's not gabion stone, because gabion stone has to come from a long, long way away. Um, so you can see, and what you've done, in effect, you've just tidied up a fly tip, haven't you? You've tidied it up, you, you bed it nice and level, it's lovely, and you make a real effort to get it in line and flat. Um, and then you're allowed then to put all these materials in there, aren't you? You're allowed to create that sort of level of complexity. So this was a project that we had, uh, uh, we got involved in up, up the road from us. Um, I guess the key thing here is to remember it's the Essex Wildlife Trust um, project. Um, you can see the visitor centre in the background. Um, two million pound visitor centre. Core 10 clad, no niches for wildlife, no green infrastructure. Two million pounds. Car park, 150 cars, no habitat, no planting. Past 
by planners, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, I just thought that can never happen. I don't know, but it just, it, 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 well, how does that happen? So we got given this plan. I remember they gave me the, the plan. Here's the plan of the car park, and I hear it like that. It just had car park spaces all the way along it, like that, 150. Um, so we were left a last minute, of course, to try and think about what we could do with something like this. So uh, we had no room, because obviously all the car park spaces, there's set size, and you had to leave that for the cars. We had no room. We had about 1,200 mil on the edge, and we had about 900 mil in the centre. Um, so we used uh, gabions to form an edge. They're full of um, uh, brick rubble. They're full of local houses, local houses in, 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 uh, in, in the gabions. Very useful. And then at the back of those, we used uh, sand from um, a local road widening. So there was a road widening down the road. All the sand from that we used in that. So that gave us the structure, and it gave us the inert, low-fertility habitat. Then we said, 150 cars, that's too many. Surely that's too many. Jesus, you know, 150 cars. So we took back about eight car park spaces and made them into gardens. And it just felt like that was kind of a real message. We made all the framing for the, car, for the gardens the same size as the car park space so people could clearly see this garden has taken the place of a car. And I, I, I just felt, I mean, I, I just think all these... These, this wonderful piece of infrastructure like car parks and lampposts, and, they're, all, they're all places to get involved and find niches and space in. And also, when you drive to a place, the car park's the first thing you see. That should be an amazing place to come in. You should really remember that. And we also put posts up um, uh, for solitary bees, just machined um, wooden posts. And we, we often do this. We, we number the, the, the posts. Uh, with the hole size. So those, those holes are a four mil hole, uh, and then we do three, four, five, up to eight. So four mil holes generally in our area get filled up with resin bees. You can probably just about see a couple of them filled up there. Um, so that's what we ended up with. Now, 40,000 pound budget, 40,000 pound budget, two million pound on the visitor center. You know, it did this whole thing, you know, like we were talking about looking after spaces, infrastructure. The money is just skewed completely weirdly. Why the hell? Two million pounds on a, on a visitor centre and you, that's all you get left with on a budget. It's mad. So, here's a few things you can do with gabions. Um, green walls. Now, I, I don't know what you guys uh, uh, think about that. I'm not a big fan. Uh, well, I am a big fan of a green wall when it's, when it's an ivy growing up a wall. I think that's a brilliant thing. I can't quite do these ones. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely ready to be proved wrong, but they just feel like lots of infrastructure, lots of gear bolted to a, to a wall. Um, you do have to water them all the time, pretty much. Uh, and if you want to weed them, you've got to get a cherry picker. So, I don't know. Uh, you know, it just feels, when, when we're working with an architect on a scheme uh, coming up where we've designed a wall of the building specifically for ivy to grow up here. So we've made it a nice texture, the top of the wall, we, the, the ivy can't get in behind the soffit, we're going to, you know, no problems. We've literally worshipped the ivy and said, this is where it's going to grow. And if you stick an ivy on a wall, I think you plant it, you look after it for a couple of months, you walk away, don't you? That's it. And then it delivers massive biodiversity and interest. Uh, there's another scheme we're going to be working on. So this is where the old Olympia um, exhibition centre was. They've crushed it up and put it on the ground, basically. It's two metres deep concrete. Um, so we're going to be uh, doing some structural stuff for that. I think Pictoria is going to do some stuff with the plant, and we're doing the structural elements of this. And again, we can't dig any holes. We're going to use, we're going to use gabions. And one of the things I'm going to try on that site is to mimic hedge banks. Now, I've always loved these things. They're not, obviously a, they're not a thing from around where I am in South Essex, but they're a really lovely thing, aren't they? They're, they're, you get the hedge and all the biodiversity that goes with that, and then you get a dry stone wall with all the structural biodiversity that goes with that. You kind of ramped up the biodiversity potential of a hedge. Um, so we're going to do that in an Essex way by putting two gabions either side and filling it for the soil. So we've basically sucked the craft out of that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, there, is, there is no craft, but, but it, I, I'm pretty, you know, it's going to do, a, I'd say it's going to do a similar thing, you know. Um, I think any piece of infrastructure, you know all the boring stuff you have to have to, to make the, the cities function, any piece of infrastructure um, we can do something with. So this was us fiddling around with planters. This is on the left is the trial 
um, uh, planter that we did in a, a trial in our garden. So that's a, that's a uh, perforated piece of steel, eight by four piece of steel, just cut down the middle, bolted together, it springs into a circle, and then in, in the centre we put a, uh, an old drainage pipe, filled it full of... So, so you can plant in there, and then around the outside we packed in sand for solitary bees and various other insects. Um, and the bees nest in through the holes in the perforated steel. And on the right is the product that we've eventually ended up with, um, sort of tidied it up. So that delivers your plants, a, a bit, a, some habitat, it delivers all that in one thing. And a street planter could do that, couldn't it? It doesn't have to be a kind of inert thing with just some geraniums or formiums in. Um, the other thing that we found amazing, and I'll talk about this a bit later, about with, with Peter in, in uh, conjunction with what Peter Korn's work is, we fill this full of sand because the, we have to have the sand in the, for the bees to nest through the holes in the front. And the plants just, the, the drought just didn't seem to, it just doesn't, it didn't hit them. You know, this, once they're established, we virtually never had to water this because it was in the sand. And there's a weird thing about sand where that top 50, 75 uh, millimeter uh, area dries out to dust and then somehow that stops the rest of it evaporating. And of course the plants it, uh, root really deeply in it. So the combination of those things, for local authorities, which is where the most of these go, hopefully they won't have to water that hardly at all. Uh, so everything, you know, this is obviously a bike shelter, every single piece of infrastructure, we should be having a conversation about how we can get some habitat into it. Um, so this is the, the, some of the cycle shelters we do. So plants on the roof, because that's horizontal. Habitat on the side, because that's vertical. No rain falls on this, rain falls on the top. Um, so that delivers, that delivers both lots of potential. Bin shelters, I mean, you know, Euro bin shelters, not the best things in the world. You know, you, that, uh, you know we, we, I love this sort of thing. You know, when you've got that really awful pieces of infrastructure that you have to have, is trying to make it a more exciting, there's an exciting place to go <laughs> is your bin shelter. Um, so easy, if you're gonna go to the trouble of building a bin shelter, it's just that next move over to make it a more uh, 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 important place for biodiversity. Um, this is um, my uh, very good friend, Wendy Allen's work. And, and it's, this is, if you get a chance to have a look at her site, she, it's beautiful. So she, she says, she makes you think what's happening. When the water comes off the roof, what, is there, you know, you, there's water coming off the roof. It focuses you in on where the water's going, what it's doing. Beautiful piece of work. She does a lot of work in, in schools. Uh, and um, so you, you know, you've added a load of biodiversity and you've delivered suds in one go. Now, here's a scheme. Um, this is a sud scheme that was foisted on us on our housing estate in Hackney. Um, they dug a big hole. You know the suds thing. They must have dug a huge hole. Loads of engineering under it. Cost a fortune. And then they dumped a load of um, sticky topsoil on top. And, wait for it, then they rewilded it. Right? <laughs> Here you go. So... And this is, this is, I think, everyone, there's been a lot of conversation about what rewilding means. And in an urban context, you know, it's a different thing. And this is, this is not rewilding. This is just bad behaviour, arrogant bad behaviour. You know, my residents live just next to this space. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's appalling. And in Hackney, we have enough bramble and nettles and vegetation that relies on, on fertile soils. We've got loads of that. We don't need any more of that. We should be thinking about the, high, the kind of habitats we haven't got. If you want to make a place more di biodiverse, you don't put more of the same. Otherwise, you, you're just increasing the biomass. And I think there's a conversation around biodiversity. Net gain is, is I know that's, that's been, I won't try and get into that too much, but that's, that's part of biodiversity and net gain, I think, is missing that that you can, like the car park, we created an open mosaic habitat in that car park. The main nature reserve was on heavy clay. So there was a, there's, a, there's a diversity that's suited to that. We added to the biodiversity by creating a different habitat. Bird hides. Now, I mean, I don't know about you, but are you, would you like, would you have really, you really ramped up about going in that place? It, it doesn't exactly, uh, it doesn't kind of, instill you with too much excitement, does it? You know, these are places that we got to make better. They're just so bad. So this is what we did in the end. So we, we built a, 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 a bird hide um, for the Wildlife Trust again. And we said, let's have a bright bird hide. Let's have, a, let's have an orange and yellow 
bird hide on the outside, right? And they just went freaky. They said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that because that's definitely going to scare the birds, right? <laughs> it's going to scare the birds. Well, it, it, it is ludicrous, isn't it? The, I mean, you know, it doesn't get up and run around, right? It stays put. But it's this, it's this kind of protocol. You know this thing about, oh, you've got to make the bird hide like this. You've got to make it dull. You're... And we said to them, we're not, we're not designing it for bird watchers because they come anyway. Right? We forget about them. They, they, they don't spend much money in the visitor centre. They, they, they bring a flask. <laughs> what, what, we're, what we're designing it for is for families and kids and all the people that wouldn't normally go to a, uh, a bird hide. We want people to go around the corner and go, yes, I want to go into that. Don't have to watch a bird, just go into it. You know? And it's got a green roof and it's got habitat on it. You know, and it's, it's a small step going from those buildings like that to, 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 to a level of... Um, um, excitement, really. And I talked about the dead tree earlier that I've tried to kill. Well, I've now resorted to uh, uh, taking some of the trees that we, we, for, uh, we, 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 uh, we get out of uh, when we do any hedge laying or coppicing. So this tree on the left, I cut it down, and I walked around with it and found a really nice, cool place to put it, and we dug a hole and put it back in the ground. So you can design in standing dead timber by just taking it there and designing it in. Right? And then you can make it part of your actual... You know, it can be part, part of your design. Now, it doesn't have to look like a, a branch. It can be a solid piece of beautifully machined uh, oak, if you want. Still standing dead. It still will decay. Still will do all those things. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's such a joy to actually reuse all the materials. Because you know, you know it's like gardening. The main pain is getting rid of the stuff, isn't it? You know, you can garden. Gardening's lovely. And then it's like, whoa, shit, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Um, so... If you can design it back into your landscape, it's so much nicer. So we've, we've tried to make compost bins. You know, they should be, we, you know, everywhere. They should, and they're, they're, they're joyous things, full of biodiversity, absolutely rammed with biodiversity. Dead hedges, another really nice thing to do. Bit time consuming, you've got to have a bit of patience if you want to make it neat and tidy, but easily become part of the landscape and the design, packed full of biodiversity. And I think when I was talking to, uh, Sid about this uh, earlier, about this kind of idea of overlapping. You know, th this whole conference has really much, very much been about overlapping all these different disciplines, hasn't it? You know what I mean? Gardeners, ecologists, all that kind of overlap. And artists, I think there's a, there's a, there's a huge opportunity for public art to be public art, look amazing, and have habitat potential. You know, and then this is, this is going to get full of bees. Um, and, it, and it's beautiful. So I think there's, there's, there's big opportunities there. This, this is more delicate. So, you know, if you're going to badly prune a tree, I mean, so, you know, I'm not suggesting you do this in, in a, maybe in a royal park. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe in a royal park, Adam. Um, but I'm suggesting there's a place for all this because as soon as you badly prune a tree like this, you ramp up the biodiversity. You really do. Honestly, you do. So we looked at everything. So we, we, we were sort of obsession with it. So acoustic walls, all those, all those walls that you, you get down the uh, your motorways and, and uh, various places, thousands of kilometres of these things, aren't they? So we thought, oh, we'll try and make an acoustic wall that's going to do more than that. So we used our lovely perforated steel. We made a 200 mil wide fence. We put perforated steel either side and we rammed it full of sand. Really good acoustically. Bees nest in through the side and you can grow plants on the top. So, you know, again, everyday stuff that you can just kind of ramp up a bit. Railings, another amazing... This is the housing estate I, I looked after in Hackney for all those years. These are my amazing residents. And the grapevine that they're picking, the grape leaves they're picking, was one of the best things we did. Um, so this is all going back... Again, just drift back to maintenance slightly. This is small tweaks to the way we looked after an estate. Right? Nothing fancy, no sexy designs just cared for and small changes that you can only do if you're a maintenance person, if you're a gardener. Um, so all the Kurdish and, and Turkish on our estate banged on to me about dolma and, and grapevine leaves. It was there, you know, it's a big deal. And we didn't have any. So, you know, it was you know, 10 quid we planted grapevines up the railings. One of the best things I ever did. I've got more handshakes, more smiley faces from that than anything. Apart from... The fact, you can see she's not that as happy. And the reason she's not as happy is because 
the grape variety that we use had really indented leaves, as you can see. Useless, actually, for rolling up for food. So we had to, in the end, we had to change that, and we got the... the, the of course, when you buy a grapevine, it's, it's, it's basically sold to you for the grapes, isn't it? That's the variety. Well, of course, the, the Turks, are, they're smart enough to know in the UK, oh, my God, you know, growing grapes outside in the UK, what a palaver. Is it worth it? But the, the, the leaves are the big thing, you know, and so we eventually got some round leaves. But the, that's just another case of classic kind of case of tweak in maintenance, virtually no cost. And then we looked at pars. Um, so, I mean, you've probably seen this done before. This, these, these metal grates have been done before, but that's a really useful way of keeping the pericity to the path, keeping the vegetation. We planted thyme under there. You know, you can do all sorts of things. You put sand under there for the bees. The, the path on the right, we used an old school um, kind of hogging, um, which is not perfect if you've got a very public path, but. We're hoping that we can get the, the bees and, and, and some of the invertebrates to nest in the path, and then, I'll, uh, then I won't have to do my carefully sculpted domes of sand in the, in the borders. If we can get them to work in the path, because as Fergus was saying, the desire lines through fields is where these things nest. They love compacted um, soils with, with very sparse vegetation. So the paths felt like that was a good place to put those. So I think it's all, it, it, it's all about niche. You, you've got to look... We, with the climate emergency and everything that's going on, it is vital we start thinking about everything we do should be that should be in our heads. So buildings, for instance, so this beautiful sparrow. Now, I don't know, I mean, there's not so many people as old as me, I don't think, but I, I remember, obviously, as a kid, all the houses were full of sparrows, weren't they? And starlings, because we had holes in all our soffits and fascias because they were rotten and wood. Um, now we don't. Now we've got plastic um, soffits and fascias. Um, so we should design this guy in. We should make a, a proper effort to design all these things into new buildings. And then you can choose where he goes, isn't it? You know, you, instead of him shitting down your front door, you can put him in a place that's more appropriate because you can design him in, can't you? You know, it's, 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 that's, and what a fascinating thing for architects. Architects should be going, yeah, wow, this is a whole new dimension to my work. I'm now looking at actually making my buildings alive. Um, and, um, you know, what, what, a, what, a, what a privilege that is, you know. And I've talked about this, and I mean, this, this just rams home that combination of gardens, structure, gardeners, disturbance. Massive biodiversity at Dixter because of all that. And look at this. Now, I love this picture because if you, if you imagine a piece of countryside, right, where would you get that complexity of materials and structure in the countryside? Very, very, you wouldn't, would you? You know, and the fact that you know, there's, there's a guy there who's got just lawn. I'm assuming it's a bloke, because you know how we love cutting grass. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's one garden with just lawn. That's fine, because next door has got shrubs, and next door has got a, a decking and places under sheds to nest. And it's that wonderful complexity, and that's been driven by people's taste. That's what's so beautiful about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, amazing. So, um, soil. Um, now, I'm guessing I'm not doing too bad for time. Um, the, this whole thing around, so this kind of counterintuitive thing around soils, as soon as I kind of flipped my mind and realized that, again, 20% of triple S uh, sites, 20% of the best quality wildlife sites are in places that have had linked to a mineral extraction. In other words, chalk pits, gravel pits, sand pits, places that were trashed smashed the pieces and then left, right? Now, how exciting is that? Because that means that all the biodiversity is going back into these places very, very quickly, isn't it? So we need to, you know, the same with the brownfield, we need to understand why that is. And it's that, again, it's that combination of, of, of different soils, different topography, chaos. Uh, and what isn't chaotic is, is a road widening embankment. So this is the A13, where I said I got that sand from before. And uh, uh, we campaigned for, for, for many years to try and stop them when they widen the road, to stop them from chucking the topsoil back on top, because they pile it all in a pile somewhere, don't they? and then they bring it all back. Um, but we couldn't do it. They covered every tiny space with it. Um, and all that does, essentially, because we, we, where we live, we've got uh, the Thames terraces, so the, you know, basically the terraces, the sandy, uh, gravelly terraces that run down to the Thames, 
gold standard biodiversity, gold standard habitat. Right next to this road, well, fairly close to this road, when they put the, they, 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 they made the embankment, they scraped the embankment, created another Thames Terrace, about a 50 metre deep Thames Terrace facing south. All those species from the Thames Terrace would have hopped, guarantee it, to that new road. But oh no, we cover it in soil. So that's taken away masses of the potential. So in the end, I found the haulier that was taking all the sand away, and, uh, and we brought it brought some of it back to our place. So we, we got about 70, uh, 80 tonnes of A13 sand. That was three different sands. The geography meant that we had thanet sand, glacial outwash and ballast. Three be immediately beautiful just because of the colour. And then, and, then, and then the topography. So again, so we added all these things in. And we had a 60% increase in bees and wasps within the first three years. 60% increase because we, are, uh, we were on heavy clay, we didn't have sand, so no matter how many flowers we had, we'd never have got those solitary bees, because a lot of them won't fly more than 200 to 500 kilometers, uh, meters away. away. Um, so as soon as we introduced the sand, we got those species. And I know Julia uh, um, uh, wonderfully is now working with the, the uh, housing development right next to the, her garden, and Dave's put in all this local sand, yes! in the front of all these buildings and planted it all up, lowers the maintenance, eventually will increase the, you know, the chance of biodiversity and just made perfect sense. Much local materials, inert materials. And we've just made him a, a nice, smart bee post. So again, insects don't care if the, if the thing looks good. Now, this is a machine CNC uh, bee post with holes in the letters. And this is what I was saying about it uh, earlier. That means that the Chateau Wood as a development the logo is alive. So that's a fairly reasonable statement from a, you know, to, to get home if you're a developer. So I guess the big light bulb moment was me. We, we've, we've sort of been, uh, no, we, we, we are quite well known for, for, for building green roof buildings. This is a, a three car garage we built. Uh, we went back to this about four years after it had been um, built. All the, the loads of the seeds and the plants from the roof had fallen off the roof and onto the granite type one driveway, and it was the most beautiful landscape I've ever seen. It was just amazing. Right? And that was the moment I just thought, the paths are better than the borders. <laughs> you know, what's going on here? What's happening? Why is that reduction in nutrient, and why is that stress creating such an exciting environment? And here's your choice, because you've got loads of choice, right? Because there's a whole building industry that's developed around you reusing materials and, and construction materials. So when I go to my local tip, and they know me well, I've been there for 25 years in there, going in and out like a yo-yo, wandering around, picking out what you know, particular uh, sand or substrate I want. Um, massive choice. And all those different materials deliver different biodiversity, deliver different uh, planting potential. Amazing. And literally two, year, two, two miles down the road. So if you're doing a scheme, if you're doing a scheme, really consider, because skips, to take stuff away costs a fortune. If you can crush the material on site and keep it on site, either underneath your patio or um, as a growing medium. And this stuff is amazing. You'll be amazed how exciting it is to start growing in this stuff. And there was a road. There's a road, and this is a guy called uh, Phil Sterling. He managed to um, uh, persuade Dorset Council to... Uh, not put topsoil on the embankment. So they scraped the embankments back, all chalk. He managed to get them to put, not put topsoil on. Well, they couldn't bring themselves to not put it on. They put about 15 millimetres on, just because they, it was just too difficult to comprehend. Um, so, and it was, it was sown with a mix, 2009. Ten years later, it is amazing. I don't know whether any of, you, any of you have ever seen this or have ever seen any documentation on it. You should look it up. It's incredible. The diversity of plants, of butterflies, it's becoming amazing. And absolutely no maintenance, no grass cutting, nothing. Now, if that gets covered in topsoil, like every other place does, and planted with trees, like a lot of other places do, not many years is it. I mean, every year you've got to cut the grass, and then, you've got to, then, then the trees get too big, you've got to come along with your chipper and your chainsaw and take the trees out. So I'm not suggesting we don't plant any trees. I'm just suggesting that we, we think about low-nutrient meadows as a solution, because the carbon... You, you just don't use carbon. There's no maintenance or tiny amounts of maintenance. 
And this is what happened. So we didn't have, these are ivy bees, which are out now, by the way. You, I don't know, you, you, you guys, if you're on sandy soil, you've probably got a good chance of having these. Amazing, beautiful creatures. We would never have those, obviously. No matter how, many, how much ivy we had, we'd never get those because we had no sand. So we're on heavy clay. We put this bank of sand, and can you see how many are in there? You know, this is the exciting thing about this. As soon as you start to mix up and add to the diversity of your materials, this stuff starts to happen, especially with invertebrates, uh, really quickly. So if you don't have breeding space, you won't get the, you won't get the chance to see this amazing pantaloon bee, you know. I mean, how cool is that? Not only has it got that wonderful kind of pantaloon thing where it collects the pollen, it is the most manic, off its head bee you've ever seen. So you can tell it's a pantaloon bee because it literally flies into the flower so hard it usually bumbles over the edge. It's just so manic, you can kind of tell it. I don't know what it is about. And of course, what um, Dave Gorsum was saying yesterday, um, and to reinforce that solitary bees are amazing pollinators, our native bees, these are our native bees. And they're good pollinators because Lot, most of the time, they get the pollen all over them. This one's a bit more careful, but most of the time, most species of solitary bees just get covered in pollen. They're very bad. I mean, honeybees are very careful, aren't they? They pack it all in. Don't drop much. Careful, don't drop much. Well, that doesn't make, and that's not good news for the next flower, is it? You know, these things are covered. They, fall, they get on the next flower up to 200 times more efficient at pollinating um, the plants than a honeybee. So, you, you know, that, they're just incredibly important species. Here's another material you can use. We use a lot of this, one of my favorites. This is uh, toilets and sinks crushed up, ceramics. They crush it, they sell the big bits as some sort of decorative uh, mulch. Can't imagine who would buy that, but anyway, decorative mulch. And then the dusty bits from, the, from that, so the waste of the waste, we buy that. So you can imagine they basically <laughs> have as much as you want. It's, <laughs> it's a terrible stuff, we don't want to go, you take it away. Um, so, the stuff on the, so the plants on the right are growing in the ceramics. No organic material, no topsoil. And brick waste, we've got a, uh, we get a, a source of a, a local... Uh, they, they, make, they must make quite a lot of mistakes, this brick factory, because they, <laughs> they have a lot of rejects, which is beautiful. Like, what a beautiful texture that is, you know what I mean? Amazing. Now, the killer, the killer one with using inert substrates and, and, uh, and uh, construction waste is it is completely weed-free, right? So you know when you're doing your meadow, right? I want to make a meadow. Everyone wants to make a meadow, don't you? And people always are. Everyone's asking about making meadows. Very, very difficult on topsoil, isn't it? it very difficult. One is you've probably got to spray it with glyphosate, <gasps> right? How are you going to get it weed-free? cover it with plastic three or four years, I don't know. You know what I mean? So to, 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 to prep the ground to sow a meadow is really hard. If you use these materials, immediately weed free. You just dump the stuff down and put the seeds straight on. What a relief. And, and the other thing is because, and, 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 and let's remember, direct sowing, what's the most sustainable way to create a landscape? By a mile, right? Is to direct sow. You know, that whole area there that you can see with the sand on it, on the left, 30 quids was the seed. And then it was like that 15 months later. Now, you're not going to create a landscape as cheap as that, are you? And you can't do that on topsoil because it's way too much maintenance, way too difficult to keep that weeded and, and do all those things. But you can do it with this stuff. It's, it's incredible. And we've been also working with UEL and the uh, uh, University of East London to, to work with industry to see what other wastes we can look at. So this stuff comes from Tate and Lyle sugar. So they use, I didn't know this, but it turns out it's the case, they use calcium carbonate to filter the sugar cane. And then once they've filtered the sugar cane, they have to get rid of it. 11,000 tons a year come out of Tate and Lyle sugar. So um, much to my wife's joy when she got home one day, this was dumped, and it stinks as well, right? It stinks bad. <laughs> so uh, it goes off, but it does stink quite badly. Anyway, amazing stuff. Right, so it's about 3 or 4% organic from the sugar cane. Other than that, it's just chalk. Uh, and we're trialing that on, um, I think the next slide shows that. We're trialing it on as, as a green roof um, um, substrate. I think it's going to be really good. Uh, this is my two mates, Benny and Sophie, who come and help me out doing this stuff. So here's a genius slide, right? Genius bloke, genius slide. How many plants do you think are in the back of that car? Anyone? Come on, you can shout. 
It's allowed. I know you're not supposed to ask questions and you've got a live. Don't put it on the live chat. Just shout. How many plants? Huh? How many? 1,000? 100,000. Okay, you're done me. It's not 100,000. 12,000 plants, right? 12,000 plants. Sorry? And the student. Damn it. I knew I'd forget that. That was the killer one. 12,000 plants and a student is in there somewhere. <laughs> Amazing, right? So, I mean, the, the, the image on the right is how many lorries, not all of them snaking around there, but seven, minimum seven lorries of pots, compost, plants to do what Peter's doing in his people carrier, right? Now, that's because, as you probably guessed, because he's using bare root stock. So bare root plants. And now, I know it's not appropriate for every situation, obviously not, but we must, and I, I know someone talked about this yesterday, I can't remember who it was, but we must start to look at this because pots and compost on these big schemes is a massive issue. Isn't it? These things, Peter takes them out of the sand like that, and then, uh, you know, so, so you, you're even leaving the sand behind, so you don't even have to top that up what they're growing in. So I think this is a, is a really interesting place for nurseries to, to start to look at. Am I supposed to be packing up now? I am. Okay. Okay. I'm going to flick through. There you go. I'm going to flick through the last few. Because I've got to get to the... I've got to get to the picture of... I've got to get to the picture... I've got to get to the picture of Ed. Okay. So there you go. 